Again, good afternoon and welcome to the workshop on reducing youth substance misuse by implementing mental health initiatives. It is truly my pleasure to see such a diverse and dedicated group of professionals, educators, community leaders, and advocates gathered here today to tackle one of the most pressing issues facing our youth, and that's substance misuse in the midst of a mental health crisis. Oftentimes, physical and mental health symptoms are deeply interwoven. Stress may give us headaches, and some may find relief from stress by using medicine, and some may find relief by using alcohol. Panic can feel like a heart attack, and one may find medical cannabis helps them alleviate the, the panic response, but also finds that later on in life, it has other side effects as well. And receiving a long delayed surgery may bring relief from a physical symptom and, and, a, a, and a, as well as the worry and anxiety. But when they find themselves using pain medication because of the surgery, far beyond the expected time frame, well, that was, that was not something that could have been foretold. So while we experience mental health symptoms throughout our entire body, our healthcare system has long separated physical health, treatment, substance misuse from mental health care. And this fragmented system can be notoriously hard for people to navigate, leading to unmet needs and poor health outcomes. So our focus today is on holistic approaches that integrate mental health strategies to prevent substance misuse among young people. And we know that the challenges our youth face are multifaceted and interconnected. So substance misuse often stems from underlying mental health issues are left unaddressed and can lead to a cycle of dependency and adverse outcomes. So by addressing these root causes, we can not only prevent substance misuse, but we can also promote overall well-being and resilience in our youth. So let's make today a productive and transformative experience together. Because together, we can create an environment where our youth not only avoid substance misuse, okay, so just and achieve. Let's get started. This is our acknowledgments. And in our acknowledgments, it just clearly states that the opinions that are going to be expressed here today are not the view of the PTTC network, and they don't reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services. You'll receive this slide deck in its entirety so you can read through every point of this. But essentially, we're just letting you know these are our opinions. Uh, these are, this is information that we've researched and we're sharing it with you. And it's not the official position of SAMHSA or the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm sure many of you have similar uh, documents like this uh, when you present as well. Our learning objectives for today are just to describe the relationship between youth mental health and substance misuse, and also for you to help to help you develop practical approaches for incorporating uh, mental health initiatives into existing substance misuse prevention programs. And then of course, to examine the various tools that we both have and the resources that are available that we wanna share with you that can help young people in maintaining their mental well-being. This is our roadmap for today. I'll provide you introductions. We'll have a short icebreaker. We'll talk with you about youth mental health, give you some of the background on it and where we are today, and then provide you some practical approaches for incorporating mental health initiatives into the work that you do. We'll have a group discussion, and then we'll share some tools with you and resources as well uh, that can help you in the work that you do. And then it's not over to the paperwork done. So we will have an evaluation at the end, and I strongly encourage you to participate in our evaluation. We need, the, we need that feedback. My name is Derek Newby, and I'm the TTA specialist uh, with the South Southwest Prevention Technology Transfer Center, which covers five states in our region, which are Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Texas. So uh, I am joined here with you uh, today by Cynthia or as she likes to be called, Cindy Rivera. One of her favorite quotes are, one of, is listening is where love begins. 
listening to ourselves and then to our neighbors. And that's from Fred Rogers. Cindy is a change consultant with over 20 years of experience specializing in early childhood and mental health across the lifespan. Her extensive nonprofit background includes working at the community level to develop and implement programs that address specific needs. Cindy has successfully collaborated with communities from Tennessee to the American Samoa, tackling diverse issues such as community volunteerism and chronic disease prevention. Driven by the belief that community members are the true experts, Cindy advocates for organizations to embrace innovative solutions to complex challenges by leveraging local knowledge. She holds a master's degree in social work from Arizona State University, along with a master's and bachelor's degree in Mexican-American studies from the University of Arizona as well. Originally from Arizona, Cindy has spent the past nine years traveling across our beautiful country as a military spouse. She currently resides in Fort Moore, Georgia, but proudly considers Arizona her home. Y'all can put your hands together for Cindy Rivera. We hear you virtually clapping. Round of applause. That's gonna start today for the our first activity. We're gonna annotate. And I don't know how many of you used annotate before, but I'm asking you to look at the top of your screen uh, and find where you have an annotate button. Click the annotate button at the top of the Zoom window where Zoom says, you're viewing my screen in green. You're looking for the pencil that says annotate. If you don't see it, you might see an option that says view options, which will bring up another option screen and then choose annotate. When the annotate bar pops up, click on the check mark for the stamp. You can see circle here in the slide. Pick a heart shape or any other stamp that you want to use in the great practice square on the side of the on the side of the slide. Okay, we got it. Now go ahead and practice stamping the gray box. I think you guys have got it. Very good. So in the next slide, you're going to see the, the MEB image. And as you look at the at that image, you'll place a stamp on the part of the spectrum where you do most of your work. So you'll put a stamp on the spectrum where you do most of your work. Okay. Okay, we're going to clear this now and go to the next screen. Thank you. So. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Thank you. I hope, oh, people are already stamping away here. So as you stamp and find where you work, on this spectrum, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. So the mental, emotional, and behavioral health spectrum, also known um, as the MEB, is a conceptual framework that encompasses the continuum of mental um, health and emotional health, behavioral health, ranging from optimal um, to severe impairment. It recognizes that mental health is not simply the absence of mental illness but a dynamic state that is influenced by many factors, including genetics, biology, environment, and life experiences. The MEB highlights that the interconnectedness of mental, emotional, and behavioral health and, ex and emphasizes the importance of early intervention, prevention, and holistic approaches to well-being. So it was developed by the Institute of Medicine, and it's based on a classification of populations based on risk levels and the development of onset of MEB uh, disorders. Um, the costs and benefits of delivering interventions to targeted populations varies along the spectrum classifications. Some of you may be familiar with this as the continuum of care. It has undergone an update that includes renaming as, as well as the high wedges within each part of the spectrum, which are sized to represent how resources should be allocated um, across various components. 
So I see so many people, all of these preventionists. So it looks like we got a lot of um, people working in prevention, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and then just to understand some of the components, mental health. So that is a person's psychological and emotional well-being. So it includes cognitive function, emotional regulation, resilience, and the ability to cope with stress and uh, adversity. Then we have emotional health. Emotional health recognizes is involves recognizing, expressing, and managing emotions in a healthy and adaptive manner. Um, it, it includes self-awareness, empathy, resilience, and um, just that emotional regulation. Um, then we have behavioral health. Uh, behavioral health focuses on patterns of behaviors that impact health and well-being. Um, it encompasses a wide range of behaviors, including those related to substance use, eating habits, exercise, sleep, and interpersonal relationships. Positive behavioral health involves adopting healthy behaviors and making choices that promote physical and mental well-being. And then we have the optional functioning. So remember, it's like the different areas of health plus where we're functioning. So optimum functioning at one end of the spectrum um, are individuals who demonstrate optimal mental, emotional, and behavioral health and they experience a sense of well-being, resilience, and fulfillment of in their lives. Optimal functioning is characterized by positive emotions, healthy coping strategies, and effective problem-solving skills. Um, and then we'll go over to that um, severe impairment. Well, we have moderate, mild and moderate in the middle of the spectrum. And those are individuals who may experience mild to moderate emotional, mental, and behavioral challenges. And then finally, at the end of the spectrum, so that's where we're starting to become, go into that treatment area, are individuals who experience severe mental, emotional, and behavioral concerns that significantly impair their functioning and quality of life. So these can include mental health disorders like anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, and also substance use disorders. And so we're gonna dive more into that today. But so, oop, there it is. Now they're gone. But it's great to see everyone. And we really had people across the spectrum. So that was so great to see. Um, Next, and in the chat, and I'm not keeping up with the chat, and I just saw there's 35, so there's no way. It's going to distract me too much. So I'm going to stay on this and trust that Derek and the crew, <laughs> the crew has the chat. Um, so major challenges facing mental health services. So a big one, and I know we're all in this together. So lack of access and affordability. This is a stat I heard in a different presentation yesterday. 160 million people in the U.S. are living in areas in, with mental health shortages. 160 million. That plays right into that lack of access and affordability. Um, there's barriers that are geographic, long wait times. Um, and we also have those affordability issues. Um, and we know that that lack of access, you know, re reduces or uh, worsens medical, uh, mental health conditions. So if we can't treat early, they can escalate. Um, so that's one piece. And then there is the mental health workforce uh, challenge. So we see that there's just not enough. There are not enough clinicians, there are not enough peer support to work in these areas and provide what is needed for people who need these services. And then we have a, our favorite thing, social media, which, you know, it's a mixed bag because on one side, social media includes some support, resource connection, right? There's these Facebook groups where you can, you know, I'm, you know, 
having issues with um, accessing care and people can get you that care. Um, but it also can increase anxiety, depression, cyberbullying, and misinformation around some of these issues. So I see some TikTok sometimes and my clinical side says, I'm not sure about that. So, and then um, there's also the systemic inequities and racism that have perpetuated our behavioral health system. And um, it has increased mistrust of the system. Um, and then it has impacts on mental health. And But there are solutions. We're all working towards solutions, right? So things like culturally competent and responsive care can really um, offset these things, increase diversity in the workforce and community-based solutions. So in the chat, are you all seeing some of these um, um, mental health challenges? Just yeah. post it now. We're waiting for the answers to come in, Cindy. Uh, it's posted. We're waiting. So yeah, so the struggle with money. Monday. Yeah, I. Crystal says yes. Yes, we. Um, I do a lot of um, just uh, focus groups with clinicians and people across the field, and that funding issue is like it's resources, it's resources, and then the workforce shortage. There is this competition for people like and. It, it's every, to me, like looking at that spectrum, it's across that whole spectrum where there's workforce sor shortages. So, yep. Um, all, of, all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> so. Looks like people are trying to annotate on the screen also, uh, which one. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So those providers. Yeah. So we're all facing those issues. So we're going to try and be solutions based. So at this point, we I think we can um, go on to our next slide. Oh, working in rural tribal community, the accessibility that resources the biggest barrier, right? And then transportation. Yeah. Um, okay. So what does this look like for youth? So um, what this graph shows is really the disparities related to poor mental health for high schoolers in marginalized groups. So you can see at the bottom that purple is um, highlighting the difference between LGBTQ plus and heterosexual um, teens. And we see over a twofold um, increase in poor mental health. And this is in the past 30 days. So, and this was the Youth Risk and Behavioral Health Survey. Um, you can get uh, access to the databases and to the state raw data. Um, and um, so we're seeing that. So that's just the past 30 days. So that's not the past year. So looking at those annual rates, you're gonna see that uh, increase too. Then we can look at um, gender differences. So again, between male and female youth, almost another double in increase in um, rate of poor mental health than their male um, counterparts. And then we see multiracial high school students. You know, when we're looking at those blue areas as kind of race and ethnicity, those multiracial um, ethnic groups have a slightly higher um, increase of poor health. And then again, this is just the past 30 days. This is not annual. And these are not kids that are diagnosed with anything. They're reporting poor mental health. Um, so, and we can move forward on this. So what we know is that female students and those who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, other and questioning are experiencing disproportionate levels of poor mental health and suicide related behaviors. For example, in 2021, 12% of female students and more than 25% of L. LGB plus 
and 17% of other questioning students attempted suicide during the past year compared to 5% of their heterosexual, of their male peers and heterosexual peers. Um, and we, we have emerging resource, uh, research around how crucial social acceptance is and fitting in are to teens well-being. Um, and what we know is that, and this is where I love prevention, um, the opportunities for connection, connection with their parents, with their peers, and the broader community can start to offset all of this. So, and that's where the exciting solutions focus part of all of this is. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, do you have anything to add? No? Good. Okay. Um, so this next slide, so data slide, I'm also an evaluator and love data. So um, the impact of major depressive disorders on substance misuse. So here we get to like the crux of it. So how are we seeing how you know, depressive disorders impact that substance use. Where are we seeing correlations? So we know that youth mental health has emerged as a major concern and um, that we have rising rates of mental illness um, and substance use in the past year. Um, so we'll see here in youth um age 12 to 17, that major dis or major depressive disorder in the past year reported significantly higher rates of illicit drug use, marijuana use, and binge drinking within the past year or month. This is consistent with recent meta-analysis that found that substance use disorders are commonly co-occur in individuals with major depression. So this is where the data really backs up with what us as practitioners probably have the inkling about, like that co-occurring co -according disorders are really impacting our youth. Um, and then we need to understand a little bit of the barriers to um, increasing uh, access to substance uh, use disorder and mental health treatment remains a focus. So. Right, because when we're talking about this, it's it's both and, right? So someone that is suffering from major disorder doesn't just need treatment for um, their depression, but also for their substance use. And not all clinicians can actually do that. So sometimes it's two things. Sometimes, and when we know there's a shortage, woo, things are getting tough, right? So um, I think... Uh, Unless we have any questions, we can move on. And then this is youth substance misuse um, among people 12 plus in the past year. This is the 2020 data. Again, we see um, just, you know, that marijuana continues to be the highest um, substance that youth are misusing. However, um, and then it goes into psychotherapeutic drugs, hallucinogens, cocaine. One of the things that I like to like sometimes like disregard, not disregard, data and percentages are really important. But I just look at, okay, we, this chart gives the perception that like heroin isn't a big deal. But for almost a million kids, 900 mil, or 900,000, that's a lot to have a heroin issue, you know? And, and I just think that uh, we need to look at these and know that these issues are pervasive. So although relative to each other, it might give off the perception that, you know, look, glancing at a chart, like it's not a big issue. It really is, especially in these communities that are already having shortages in treatment facilities and um, clinical um, facilities. So, and we know that poly substance use, which this does not capture. So youth having issues with more than one substance 
um, is also an issue and that um, we need treatment providers to screen for and treat all substance use disorders and um, problem substance use. This is tough. These are tough things to do. So getting all of our treatment services aligned and able to do what we need to do is challenging, but we can get there. And we know that 50% of individuals reporting heavy alcohol use in the past month also um, used marijuana in the past year. I think as we see the legalization of marijuana, this is slowly, this is creeping up, right? Right, because we know Derek's gonna de uh, delve into risk and protective factors, but when access increases, guess what also increases? Use. So it's that, it's the direct train to use is increased access, which we have now. Um, and then people age 12 and older engaging in heavy alcohol use also report significantly higher rates of opioid, cocaine, and meth use um, than people just using alcohol, but not with heavy use. So um, it's consistent with the literature suggesting both that poly substance use is occurring at high rates, and then also that the co-occurring disorders of mental health and depression along with substance misuse is occurring. So um, that, um, we, just to reiterate, reiterate the slides, those uh, data slides, um, youth age 12 plus with depression have higher rates of drug use. So that's something to think about in our prevention programs and who we partner with, right? Uh, depression and alcohol use often co-occur. So these are not happening in silos. They're happening uh, together with each other. And that someone with depression has a threefold risk of developing alcohol use in their lifetime. So that's where early intervention really is important, right? Early detection, because if we can start getting treatment for the depression, we might not have an alcohol use disorder later in life. So this is where we're all partners together. Um, you're absolutely correct, Cindy. I'm, I'm glad you left them with these strong takeaways because across the spectrum, this is something that we can all look at and, and be very clear about in our messaging and that uh, the, we have to work closer with youth in order to, to try and mm -hmm. alleviate some of these problems, both the depression and the mental health issues, as well as the substance issues. And if we know the population uh, being youth age 12 and plus, we know that the uh, that uh, depression is one of the, the signs and symptoms, then you, and also that knowing that individuals with depression are three times fold likely to develop this alcohol use disorder, then it, it right. emphasizes the work that we have to do. And I want to um, show you guys a quick video uh, at this time as well. And as you watch this video, I want you to look for the common mental health and substance misuse warning signs, because oftentimes that's what we miss. And that's the warning signs. And if we know what the warning signs are, it can trigger us to even work harder with this population. And uh, truly, all of us have to be working together, whether it's a, uh, a teacher at school or a preventionist or even the, the personal health uh, care provider that the person may have. It has to be a team effort in order to alleviate the problems. And oftentimes, sometimes the parents are busy, even the doctors, uh, when they do the physicals for the youth at school, they're only with them for a few minutes in order to do just that part. But if they did just a little bit more, oh my goodness, we could really help a lot. So let's watch this video and keep that in mind. And uh, I'll give you some time in the chat afterwards to, to say what some of those common mental health and substance misuse warning signs are that you saw. Intense worries or fears that get in the way of daily activities. Sudden overwhelming fear for no reason. Or seriously trying to harm or kill oneself 
or making plans to do so. Not eating, throwing up, or using laxatives to lose weight. Significant weight loss or weight gain. Severe, out-of-control, risk-taking behavior that can cause harm to self or others. Repeated use of drugs or alcohol. Drastic changes in behavior, personality, or sleeping habits. Or extreme difficulty concentrating or staying still. If you see these signs in yourself or a friend, tell a trusted adult. The first step to getting help is to say it out loud. So as you watch that video, and you can place it in the, the chat now, uh, what were some of the signs that you saw that you pulled out of there? And some that you maybe have seen already. Wow. Okay, not eating? Yes. And sometimes, of course, that can be taken as, um, when you see it in teenagers, as just being a part of being a teen. But yep, the weight loss, uh, the behavior change. So you've seen a lot of these things in the work that you do. Difficult concentrating. Wow. Seeing all of these and they're seeing them, uh, Cindy, uh, what do you think the, should, let's talk about the importance of incorporating some mental health strategies about some of these things. Yeah. Well, and honestly, it's tough, especially with teens because they're rapidly changing and developmentally, you know, where they're going to sleep more, you know, <laughs> expect your teen to sleep more. However, if you think that it's, you know, sleep in to avoid, then yeah, that's like, that's something to start. Oh, is that, is that right? Or multiple um, kind of um, just connections, just things that you're seeing. So, um, but it can be really tough. Um, to Nathan also wanted to emphasize that many of these signs are signs of sexual abuse and trafficking, which are compounding the challenges as well. Yep. So um, all of the withdrawal, I think that that's something if you isolation withdrawal, these are things that should like sound the alarm. Um, whereas some of the other ones can kind of just be like, that's something I'm going to watch. But that isolation and withdrawal definitely um, start to move on that. So um, what we do know is that um, mental health integration offers promising solutions to addressing the individual's total health needs. So it can improve health outcomes, it can reduce health care costs, and enhance the quality of life. Um, so, and it's person-centered. So when we think about improving health, health outcomes, it's integrating mental health strategies to better manage both mental and physical health conditions and enhance overall well-being. Screening at the doctor, screening at the school nurse, these things can help um, with early identification and referral to treatment. Uh, reduced health costs by preventing and managing mental health issues effectively, healthcare systems can reduce costs associated with emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and chronic conditions. Also, the stress it puts on the system to respond to emergencies, whether they are um, cri like crisis, any behavioral health crisis. Um, and then enhance quality of life, right? That's what we want. Um, that's optimal is addressing mental health, um, improves patients' quality of life, promotes better relationships and, uh, just overall daily functioning. And then we are, um, you know, wanting to have patient centered care. This is mental health integration that allows for more personalized and holistic care, focusing on individuals, needs, preferences, and strengths. Um, I really think that's important. Um, so does drug use cause mental, uh, 
mental disorders or vice versa. Uh, we do know that they can coexist. And in some cases, mental health disorders such as anxiety, depression, and schizophrenia may come before addiction. In other cases, drug use may trigger or worsen the mental health conditions, particularly in people with specific vulnerabilities. There's new emerging research on this coming out every day. You know, there wasn't a ton of research on the impacts of marijuana on mental health um, prior to the last decade. And now we're getting more and more research that shows um, some linkages. So, and we know that people with severe disorders like anxiety and depression may use a drug in an attempt to alleviate psychiatric symptoms. They're trying to self-medicate. Um, and this may exacerbate their mental disorder in the long run and um, cause addiction. So treatment for all of these conditions um, should happen concurrently. And, you know, that lack of access, lack of affordability, that plays into this. You know, when people are trying to self-medicate, it's not always just on themselves. It is really true to a system that is not ready, prepared to care for everybody, Right. Um, so I think I often use the analogy at that time, Cindy, like if you woke up in the middle of the night and your house is on fire, uh, do you run around and try to find out who set the fire or do you get everybody out the house and save their lives? And that's where right. we're at in the crisis we're in now. We don't, we can't really say definitively, uh, which causes the other. It's the mental yeah. health that's, that's caused the, the substance abuse problems or the substance abuse that's caused the mental health problems. But we do know. We have to save our youth. Yeah, and that they're like this. They are working hand in hand with each other. So uh, this is a question for you all. So what are the common mental health issues you're observing with the youth in your community? Um, and it, has anything changed? You know, the big C happened, what, four years ago, COVID? And I just feel like... <laughs> Absolutely. <gasps> We're in the new world now, and we don't always recognize that we're in that new world of post-COVID. And um, youth across the lifespan are really having big impacts. So, um, you Come can on, add that. Yep. I know I was seeing a lot of anxiety. Oh my good, anger, mm -hmm. anxiety. Mm-hmm. Ooh, more desire to join community events. I like that one. Um, your students talk a lot about anxiety. You know, I cannot not mention the movie Inside Out 2, which came out this summer and really highlighted what anxiety is. And it's great because that is such an easy way to put words, associate words with what people are feeling and how developmentally appropriate it is that like at this age, you know, that the natural anxiety is going to go up, but then there is, you know, when it, it moves past that, you know, um, isolation, anxiety, too much social media, spike in eating disorders, Depression, anxiety. The well, Surgeon yeah. General put out a warning about, you know, um, the use of social media and mental health in youth. Um, and I think that um, hopefully will also uh, open the doors to more funding, more research, so we can really understand this stuff and start putting practices alongside. Um, a lot of good points on here. Video Substances games. can change your body chemistry, leading to and affect your mental health. Right. Yeah. But with the video game violence issue, uh, mm -hmm. long before we started seeing the shoot the school shootings, and then all of a sudden, then they had to find someone to blame it on, and uh, they went there for that. So, uh, so much that people put in. Oh, here's a new one. Kids seem to want to gaslight adults when confronted now. <laughs> that's that's um, wow. 
Well, I, and part of it, I think, is, you know, helping everyone have the same language around what we're saying, you know, and not the stigma around uh, depression and anxiety. So when an adult says, like, uh, talks to a teenager about anxiety and depression, it can sometimes it can make a teen feel kind of defensive. But if you started kind of socializing younger kids to like understanding these uh, feelings, then it you it grows with them. Okay, yeah. so how far are you okay with me going? Like, like do you want to be able uh -oh. oh, a lack of empathy. I also just see isolation in that we were told to stay in our house you know, for months, and some people really liked it, and some youth really um, got, like, suddenly kids in youth programs that I was working in, they don't get their driver's license anymore, you know, back when I was growing up, you got it when you turned 16, and now they're like, well, where do I have to drive to, and I'm, they can door dash everything, so just the way society has shifted also can lead to kind of some isolation, yeah. Someone noted in that community saying like a lack of social skills. And I think that was another fallout um, of that isolation period as well. When you're not around mm -hmm. people all the time, you don't know necessarily how to interact with people. So yeah. Ineffective and uh, poor communication skills. So much in here. So much. Yeah. So let let's talk about for a moment uh, some of the things that we can do. And well, I'm going to start this out by just asking somebody if you'd like to, any one person just want to unmute and just give me that definition of risk factor. Read it out to me. Get you involved here. Any attribute, characteristic, or exposure that precedes and is associated with a higher likelihood of problematic outcomes. Did you want an example of a risk factor? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Go ahead and give us one, please, uh, Courtney. An example of a risk factor would be like absentee parenting. If the parents are not in the home due to if they're in jail or if they're in foster care, if they've been removed from the home, trauma usually is a huge risk factor. Excellent, Courtney. I can, which part of the spectrum do you work on? So I work on a melding, a melting pot. I actually am a prevention counselor with a community-based organization, and yeah. I do harm reduction from the addictive addiction counselor perspective with the youth and young adults. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. So uh, you can't come with a better, clearer definition of risk factor than that, and. Uh, uh, this was actually one of the most in, important research projects of the 20th century, and it was ex it was done by Dr. Dalbeer in the study which Dalbeer led from 1949 to 1966, where he found links between like vascular disease being the leading cause of death in the United States and diet or blood pressure and obesity and exercise and smoking. So he coined the term risk factor in 1961. And that term has now been applied to other diseases as well and disorders and other circumstances and events. So it's very important that we understand risk factors and, and know that is something that we can impact as we can, we can change risk factors, we can decrease risk factors, and we can affect our community that way. Um, when we start talking about uh, protective factors on the, on the other side of that coin, uh, protective factors, uh, and someone else, if you could read this for us. Just unmute and read it out. Any uh, any attri attributed uh, characteristic or exposure that proceeds and is associated with lower likelihood of problematic outcomes. Excellent. Thank you for, so much, Dorian. So we have our risk factors and our protective factors. And our protective factors are the characteristics at that individual, the family or the community level that are associated with lower likelihood of a problem occurring. Uh, so risk factors 
increase, our protective factors reduce the negative impact of those risk factors. And what some of those are like resilience because that's the ability to recover or adapt in adverse events. And a lot of us have that, they have that resilience. And that's what's gotten us through uh, the adversity that we've uh, experienced within our life. So it, it has protected us. And culture can also be a protective factor. Um, in some cultures, um, uh, people have a very close knit and they communicate with each other on a, on a, on a regular basis and they share their experiences with, with each other. So uh, that becomes a protective factor being part of their culture. Uh, if they have belong to a culture where uh, alcohol is not utilized within that culture, that's a protective factor as well. Because if there's lack of access and, and you're not seeing that behavior uh, around uh, with the people that are in your community, then there's lack, less likelihood that you'll indulge in it. But prevention is not just eliminating the negative behavior. It's also about supporting those protective factors. We can increase protective factors in our community, and we can decrease problems that way. And that's one of the things that we have to strive to do to optimize the well-being of youth within our community. This uh, slide talks about shared risk and protective factors. It shows the, the clear connection that we're trying to, to demonstrate here today, that, that nexus in between. And those preventive interventions are often designed to produce a single outcome but research has shown that risk and protective factors are associated with multiple outcomes. For example, a, a, a negative life event such as a divorce or a sustained neighborhood violence are associated not only with substance abuse, but also with anxiety, depression, and other behavioral health problems. So what it tells us is that the prevent, the preventive efforts targeting a particular set of risks and protective factors have the potential to produce positive effects in multiple areas. And that interventions with multiple benefits can lead to a broad improvement in health. And also that makes it more cost effective when it's done that way as well. It's an investment in the community when the mental health field and the prevention field work, work together because risk and protective factors can, can strengthen or they can limit the presence of other factors and disorders over a lifetime. Um, just to give you an example, risk factors such as poverty and family dysfunction. They can contribute to later psychosocial problems and behavioral disorders such as risky sexual behavior and depression. But moreover, risk and protective factors within one particular context, such as the family, may also influence or be influenced by factors in other contexts as well. For example, the effect of parenting has been shown to mediate effects of multiple risk factors, including poverty, uh, parental divorce, uh, parental bereavement, and parental mental health problems. So the more we understand about how risk and protective factors interact, the better prepared we will be to develop approaches that are appropriate and interventions that will be functional. So in the past, prevention practitioners typically focused on a select group of factors that they thought contributed to a specific issue or they produce a single outcome. But today, today practitioners have begun broadening their lens to look at connections between risk factors and implement effective programs strategically to address multiple outcomes. So we can tackle the shared risk and protective factors as preventionists, as well as those mental health professionals, they can also be very diligent in helping to change things in that field by focusing on those shared risk and protective factors. Because the relationship between risk factors and the development of a substance use disorder is complex. And for complex problems, it takes complex solutions. We have to work together. I got a handout. Um, it's going to be, they're going to put a link uh, for you into the, the chat. And with that link, uh, you'll also have a better understanding that uh, co-occurring substance use and mental disorders are common. Uh, it's just a takeaway for you so you can see it in, in black and white and take that away with you because there's empirical evidence that supports this lens. And it reveals that several factors place young people, young adults at increased risk for substance misuse. And these are the risk factors and they're identified by at least two longitudinal studies. 
Some of these factors emerge during childhood and adolescence and provide early opportunities to intervene, but other factors more related to young adulthood, like friends engaging in substances, point to the importance of a social context that involve greater freedom and less social control, such as attending college and living in a community with laws and norms favorable for uh, the use. And that's where we often run into some of the, the barriers, especially in prevention. Uh, uh, the community has the laws in place. You can't be 20, you have to be over 21 to consume alcohol. But if it's not being enforced, then it's not likely that uh, they're going to make any decreases in the, as that being a risk. Because if there's heavy availability, as uh, Cindy has said, there's going to be when people have access, there, there's more chance that they're going to they're going to use it. So therefore, risk factors not only emerge at different stages of the development, but also across uh, different contexts or levels as well. Uh, I'll say it shortly: you're safer at home in an environment where there's no alcohol uh, than you are going to college in a, in a dorm where there are people who are over 21 and they have alcohol right in their rooms or they're having parties off campus where there's plenty of alcohol. So uh, even though college may be a protective factor because it's gonna, it's gonna give you education, it also presents its own risk factors as well because of, of different changes and freedom that are associated with it. So. We got to change everything overall, but um, it, it it takes all of us working together. So, protective factors for substance misuse in the youth specifically. Uh, this is a this list is definitely not all inclusive, uh, but it, I want to point out a few things to you about like especially gender, uh, because conventional wisdom is right on this one. Girls get into less trouble than boys do. Whether it's testosterone or social conditioning, boys are at a greater risk for all problems, behaviors, uh, except teenage pregnancy. And resilient temperament. Some children and adolescents simply seem to be better able to weather difficulties than others. And they, they can experience numerous risk factors without losing their ability to cope reasonably with whatever comes up. And they, that was, has been demonstrated in multiple occasions in the ACEs studies as well. And then positive orientation. I see a hand up. Nathan, you raised your hand. Is there someone you want to say? Intrusion. Yeah, I apologize. Do you mind repeating your comments regarding gender? I, I missed that. I, I got ahead of distraction. Oh, I simply said that conventional wisdom is, is right on this one. Girls, from all of the studies that we've seen from the risk and protective factors from the, uh, the mental, emotional, and behavior disorders across the life cycle, Girls get into less trouble than boys do. They don't know whether it's linked to testosterone or it's just the social conditioning uh, where boys are behaving differently because that's expected of them. Uh, but boys are at greater risk for all problems whenever uh, these results come in um, and behaviors except for teenage pregnancy. And then also uh, positive orientation, children who are optimistic and cheerful, uh, they tend to enjoy other people and, and are themselves well-linked and well-liked within their community. Uh, they, they have a reduced risk as well. So, uh, and that seems to be across the, the, the board for all problem behaviors as well. So uh, I have six children. One thing I can say for sure, uh, when we're, no child is the same, but I, as I, started to raise my children and, and and learn more, the more that I tell them my expectations and the more I share with them what I, who I believe they are, the more they start acting out that behavior versus uh, the opposite. When I, if uh, it's shared with the kids like, oh, he's bad or this, he's not going to be anything. Those negative reinforcements, then they tend to try to, try to uh, define themselves by the negative things that people are saying about them as well. So um, it's it's very clear that children are like sponges. They receive what we're saying. It affects some more than others, but um, another uh, thing that you see here on the list is intelligence. And that stood out to me because it's a defense against delinquency and it's a defense against like school dropout. 
Like if they're more intelligent, they're doing well in school and it's being reinforced to them with their grades and with their teachers and their peers, then they're less likely to drop out. But that intelligence doesn't protect any of us and any youth against uh, substance misuse. I want to take a quick poll with you. Uh, so uh, which protective factor, as we talked about them, do you have the most influence on in your community? Which one do you think you have the most influence on in your community? Seems to be if it keeps with this trend about even across them. So we, because we have people, this is expected, Cindy, because we have people here that are they're working mm -hmm. across the spectrum. It's about even on how the, they're influencing. So we got people here that can affect everything. Which is great because that means partnerships, 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 collaboration, right? And then we can reach we reach more people. So that's great to see. That is great to I see. I was wondering where that was, that was going to <laughs> shake out. Um, yeah, probably about 30%, 30%, and 40%. Yeah. So. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. I'll share the results with you as well. Y'all can all see. You have tremendous opportunities just right here in this room. And I think, um, oh, oh, we'll oh, go back. Ahead. oh, no, I was just going to say that, you know, working across multiple domains of community, family, individual, I think that's where we start to have really robust prevention programming. So um, it's good to see that. Um, and I just got this slide up here because I just wanted to emphasize what we just talked about. I talked with you about shared risk and protective factors. But again, as we leave this section, I want to talk with you about shared interventions and using shared interventions to address the shared risk and protective factors related to substance misuse and mental health disorders it offers several key benefits. And these shared interventions leverage the interconnected nature of risk factors such as trauma, family conflict, and social isolation, as well as protective factors like strong family bonds and positive peer relationships and community support. So here's how they're, they're, they're essentially beneficial. And that is efficiency and cost effectiveness. It's, it's a no brainer. If we pool our resources and we work together, we can have a broader impact by targeting shared risk factors such as early behavioral problems or adverse childhood experiences. And those interventions can prevent or mitigate the onset of both substance misuse and mental health disorders and amplify the impact of our efforts. And then through comprehensive approaches, just like we're doing uh, today by Cindy is working with us at the Prevention Technology Transfer Center. Uh, because we have shared messaging and shared support. A shared intervention ensures that the message and strategies used to address these issues are consistent and they provide clear guidance for individuals and their support networks. And this reduces confusion and helps reinforce positive behavior, such as uh, positive behavior across different areas of the life as well, across the whole spectrum. And then, of course, through strengthening protective factors, uh, uh, many shared interventions involve family and communities, uh, and that's both mental health interventions as well as prevention interventions. And I mean, when we're working together across programs that focus on family communication and parental involvement, and both of us are, are at the table and working with our community and with our schools, and we can simultaneously reduce the risk of substance misuse and improve mental health outcomes. So using shared interventions to address shared risk factors and protective factors related to substance misuse and mental health disorders is a strategic and effective approach. It maximizes our resources, it promotes holistic care, and it strengthens protective factors and improves accessibility. And it supports long-term positive outcomes. So by focusing on the interconnectedness of these issues, the shared interventions offer a comprehensive and sustainable solution to improving overall mental health and reducing substance misuse. And I, I encourage you all, in, incorporate this message somewhere in your five-minute speech. So when you're talking with your, your 
your coalitions and the people within the, in your community, even your providers, everyone starts to understand this. Uh, what we do uh, affects our, our youth. We have to have a unified message. And we have to work together in order to strengthen the work that we do. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things just to chime in here, like on the mental health side, I was a preventionist before I was a clinician. And what I can say is what I think about is like when there's prevention programs like life skills, when kids have access to that and then are later with me in a clinical setting, it makes it a lot easier for me to do the, my job because they've already been primed with some knowledge of social skills and, you know, uh, problem solving. So this is how what preventionists do really, really set the stage for if some there's some clinical intervention later, it's helpful. Like, and I've seen it work. So I just look at this continuum and think like, yes, it's a continuum, but there is, there's so much overlap. So, um, and, um, I think, yeah. And I think that, you know, communities can create this supportive environment, um, that promotes what mental health well-being, um, among youth, um, with education and awareness problems, counseling services. It's just the whole gamut that we got to do it all. It's got to be comprehensive. Um, and there's so many approaches oh and I'm God. so curious about uh, what you all do as far, as far as your prevention approaches, since I've been out of that for a while, like what's still there, you know? Are we still doing Botman's life skills training, you know? Um, and because I still, I love that curriculum. I still use it to the state with adults sometimes. <laughs> um, and Andy, I think- Andy yeah. wants to chime in for a moment. Oh, oh yeah. We are, doing, we are doing life skills, Botvin for middle school. Yeah. We are using Teen Intervene. Mm -hmm. We're using Too Good for Drugs uh, for the elementary and the middle school. We're using Too Good for Drugs and Violence in the high school. Um, I think just coming from a time like I don't know how old everyone I know everyone here is 21 and we're all celebrating anniversaries of being 21 <laughs> um but our time we weren't allowed to talk about what was wrong so now getting more of our more of our youth to feel comfortable in that space mm -hmm. um having them realize like the life skills the too good for drugs you can tell that it's kind of dated so unless you have up to date, like what we do in keeping with the fidelity of the program, it's just trying to, okay, like they're saying this, let's tie it to today's current events. So bringing up those events, that's what at least I, I facilitate in the high schools and um, middle schools here in New York. And we try to like just tie it. Okay. So for example, when you have to use effective communication, all right? So you're on a line for a free concert and somebody comes and elbows you in the face. What's, what are your choices of doing? We're trying to teach them the difference between aggressive, assertive, and passive. So just tying in today's current events and making it more realistic, mm -hmm. but also telling the kids like, hey, like we know you're going through stuff and maybe people before may have told you, don't talk about it what you're going through is not that big of a deal and just kind of putting the the life into like you, what you're going through is, ser is serious and having the, the tie-in of the substance abuse and mental health is huge. I think we're here in New York, like at the Oasis program, they're starting to see the two connections mm -hmm. and it's just pretty interesting. Yeah. I, I love that lesson, so I, um, the passive, aggressive, and assertive, because I still think about that, like, to myself, like, how do I get this across in an assertive way? So, and I think what you're saying, Angelina, is that you know you can help, like, design so that it fits your community and what the youth in your community are really dealing with. So if that means you know, associating it to YouTube videos or all the things we didn't have back then when I was doing it, 
Um, it's just um, really exciting that you can do that. And I think that's a great part of being embedded in a community that allows you to do that. So, and there's other programs too. I know that we can talk about um, other educational awareness things, uh, workshops that are quick and then more full on curriculum that integrate uh, mental health topics. Because a lot of times on the clinical side, we'll call it psychoeducation, but just having someone understand what anxiety is and that is it, it is an actual like your brain is doing this to you. This is not something like that, like your brain is wired to do this is so helpful for a youth that's feeling that to move to, to get to learning coping skills around it. So just that education. Um, and I think we have like peer mentorship programs, huge fan of that. I just love prevention. So seeing all like thinking about prevention and how it can play such a pivotal role in kind of mental health um, services. I think we just shouldn't silo ourselves. You know, it's got it. We got to build off of each other. Um, so let's talk about um, but where those interventions uh, affect us at those phases. And here it just gives you an, an idea and when we talk about working across the whole spectrum uh, of what things can be done, because interventions for mental health and substance misuse are critically important at various stages of youth development, as you guys have already emphasized and, and gave me that feedback. And as they, they help prevent the onset of issues, you also address emerging problems and you support recovery and you can re support long-term well-being, but this slide demonstrates that interventions can be useful across different developmental stages. So programs that teach parents how to provide a stable and loving environment can prevent early adverse childhood experiences and that contribute to mental health and substance misuse issues later in life. So you're, you're working upstream by helping the mom before she has the child so that you can, you don't have, that child doesn't have to have the adverse uh, early adverse experiences or screening for early signs of mental health issues and providing timely support. That can prevent the escalation of the problem. And interventions can also include like family-based approaches that involve parents in addressing emerging behavioral concerns or with adolescents, it's critical. It's a critical period as well. So for the onset of mental health disorders and substance misuse, interventions during this stage, they have to focus on reducing the risk factors such as peer pressure and enhancing the protective factors, like strong family bonds and academic engagement. So um, substance misuse, education and prevention, it, 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 we see a lot of that work take place in the schools uh, because uh, community programs as well, uh, it's, it's just easy picking. It, that, that's the low bearing fruit. And, when we educate those teens about the risk and substance use and provide alternatives such as involvement in the sports and the arts, that, that has proven to be effective as well. So uh, those peer led initiatives though that we talk about, can, they can only, they resonate very well with adolescents as well because they're, they're growing in their maturity at that time. And then crisis intervention for those uh, who begin to exhibit signs of substance misuse or mental health crisis, Timely intervention such as counseling, therapy, and involvement in support groups, that, that's crucial to prevent further deterioration. We have to start working upstream in order to prevent the problems downstream. So uh, National uh, Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine is where we got this, this, this data from to help you. And you're going to get this in the... Um, in the resources at the end of, of the slide deck as well. So when you get a copy of this slide deck, you'll be able to check out some of these things closely. But uh, interventions for mental health and substance misuse are vital at every stage of youth development, if I could had to sum it up for you. And by addressing the unique needs of each development phase, these interventions can prevent issues from rising. You can mitigate the risk and you, you can effectively support young people in leading healthy, fulfilling lives. Uh, Cindy, 
can you talk yeah. about, and I don't really like to talk about problems, but let's talk about approaches. How about that? <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, we, we have to acknowledge that accessibility, right, is a big issue that not only do we have a lack of providers and programs, but sometimes they're just not very easy for people to access. Maybe it's not in their language. Maybe it's too far. Maybe it's during a time that they cannot attend. So our job is to really problem solve these things and get our services to where people can most readily access them, right? Um, and then, I mean, the slide is before is like chef's kiss good. Derek, I mean, because it shows that lifespan and, you know, those early years, prenatal and then early childhood. So it shows early intervention because early intervention shows so many big impacts all the way to outcomes related to mental health and behavioral health, but also economic impact, academic achievement. Like when we can get in early, we can have huge impact. So we also want to intervene early. Like when we do suspect that there might be a behavioral health issue, the sooner we can get in, that just is cost savings on the back. And then also that reduction of stigma. I do feel that some of the socialization we have around like social media helps reduce stigma because they're putting information out there about behavioral health challenges and reducing that stigma. We have to keep working at it. We had a big hill to overcome, right? Where people were not supposed to talk about it, that it was shameful. And then in some cultures, absolutely not to be spoken of. So I think that's really important. We're still trying to get over that hump, right? But we're getting there. I feel like there's been a lot towards that. And then finally, the holistic approach. Um, and I think that that's just, we're combining what works for people, looking at someone as a whole person and not just one thing. So it might be multiple approaches. It might be, um, different trainings or different things for different youth. So I do want to um, move forward because I think we're a little bit behind. So, And as we move forward, and let's talk about the overview of existing substance misuse program. You guys gave me an incredible list in the chat already, and I sincerely appreciate it. But And I think some of them are up here already. So I think if, if uh, you see one, that you uh, are using that you that's up here on the screen right now. If you can just uh, put, write the name of it in the chat so we can see uh, how many of these are, are, are packs. Okay. Get to this point, we feel like we're preaching to the choir. You guys showed demonstrated some some knowledge very early on, and we appreciate it. Uh, avoid. Okay. List packs. Okay, and that goes on. Uh, like I have one, one get, called Incredible Years that's listed. And it's Incredible Years is a series of interlocking evidence-based programs targeting children, parents, and teachers. And that program aims to reduce behavioral issues in children and improve social emotional competence. And it has a focus on children that are three to eight. And it includes training for parents to promote positive parenting, classroom management strategies for teachers, and social emotional skills training for children. So it's that that uh, collaboration that we talked about earlier, where uh, they're taking it holistically with this approach. And incredible years is is a uh, a program that can be used, and it enhances the family, it enhances the school environment. Uh, it it's it, it's multi pronged, and the program helps to prevent future mental health issues and substance misuse. So. Uh, when you asked earlier, are there any programs that address uh, both? Uh, clearly, there they, they are. And uh, again, when you get this slide deck, if you look back in the resources, then you'll be able to go and you'll get this comprehensive list as well. Uh, paths. I saw people already saying they're using paths as well. And, uh, but this this list again, it's not all inclusive, but there's a lot of good things 
on here. These universal programs, they address risk and protective factors that are common to all children in a given setting, such as a school or a community. And the selective programs are for groups of children and teens who have specific factors that put them at increased risk of drug use. And those indicated programs, of course, are designed for youth who have already started using substances. I have a short video for you now about youth mental health interventions as we just talked about some. Mental health and physical health are critical to our overall well-being. The youth mental health crisis was intensified by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's time for all of us to be equipped to support our youth. We can all help when a person is experiencing a mental health crisis. When it comes to youth mental health, families, friends, mentors, and even bystanders can be first responders. Here are five ways to help. Safety, make sure there's no current danger of physical or psychological harm. Calm and comfort, listen and ease their distress. Connect, help connect them with a friend, family member, mentor, teacher, or coach that they trust. Empower, build their confidence and reassure them that they're capable of finding a way forward and that they're not alone. Hope, communicate hope and speak positively that things can and will get better. When you see youth in distress, you can help. Reach out Seattle, call or text 988. Together as first responders, we can all make a difference especially for the youth in our lives. Remember that mental health is physical health. The body doesn't know the difference. We have a few moments now. Uh, uh, Cindy, if you don't mind, we'll entertain a few questions, but I uh, want to try. We have this, this brief group discussion for you about, you know, implementing youth voice. So how can we implement youth voice initiatives to help reduce mental health challenges and substance uh, use. And you can uh, either type in the chat or you can uh, open your mic if you feel comfortable doing so. We want everyone to feel included. But we'll, uh, we'll entertain this for a couple of minutes. We want to make sure we still stay on time. Uh, but how? How can we implement youth and uh, voices to initiatives to help reduce mental health challenges? I see, let, you know, youth lead peers listen to peers isn't that i mean didn't we we see that like the <laughs> risk in that but there's also the risk towards good too so we can do that like kind of the uh, social marketing that flips the script like most kids aren't actually drinking you know um youth led love it peer to peer with focus on stigma youth focus groups. I have been a part where we led youth focus groups, but we also gave them the tools to develop the questions, analyze the data, speak on the data. And so now they have skills, some of those social skills, some of those hard skills that they could lead the program with. Um, Your land focus. Lived experience, yeah. Love, always lived experience. These are great ideas. And yeah. I hope everyone is taking note of these ideas as well. Engage youth organizations and empower them. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Go to where youth are, right? Like there are some of those trusted youth organizations, both along with schools, along with um, I'm so interested in the sports um curriculum that someone posted up. I'm going to go back through the chat and pull curricula out. out. Uh, we start a lot of our trainings. Uh, oh, that most youth are not drinking, right? right. So, yeah, right. great Thank idea. You, so we're at the point now, we're going to talk to you about some tools and resources. And of course, we're, we're going to be sharing those with you as well, but we want to just talk about some, some tools and resources because the MH uh, TTC network, it provides training and technical assistance, and it creates and disseminates resources and support and workforce development for mental health field, but maybe I shouldn't be the one talking to you about this. Cindy, do you want to expound more on 
uh, some of the tools and resources that you uh, provide, uh, that would be very helpful to everyone. Definitely. And I do want to caveat this with in the cycle of federal funding, the MHTTC will be sunset at the end of September. So you have until September 30th, go on, access all the things, because I hopefully you, you know how these things are. So, um, and a new round of kind of mental health um, training and technical assistance around school-based stuff will come about in a couple months after that, but awards are happening, all of that. So I do want to caveat, please go soon to access any of this stuff. So I'm going to say that there's just a few things that we've done. Uh, um, MT, MHTTC is implementing change. Um, this was an intensive technical assist pro assistance project that have significant impact on mental health prevention, treatment, and recovery services. We have um, the Texas School Mental Health Professional Learning Community and support of small rural school districts. So very targeted support happened. Um, in partnership with the Texas Education Agency and Texas Health Services. And it was really to increase the uh, rel um, relevance of the learning opportunity and pilot implementation um, within the state. So you can see there are, they house learning communities. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you um, watch for uh, sign up for the mail list so that you're getting all of the most recent uh, or all of the information related to MHTCC as it sunsets out, and then hopefully notification of what the next iteration of that will be. I will also tell you and drop in the link. I also work for the National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Youth Mental Health. Um, so that also provides a whole array of services that is not sunsetting. And um, so you can also access um, those services too. So I want to um, lead you with, there are still services out there and you can still access MHTCC. It's just like they're their peer groups, their learning communities aren't really going to be happening right now, but head over to NTAC and you can get them there too. So, um, I, so I think um, with that, um, if you want to forward the slide, um, these are some really cool initiatives that MHTCC had and materials that you can find on the site. Um, so, and this was part of a partnership with the National Center for School Mental Health to assist uh, 15 schools and school districts in adopting classroom-wise a three-part mental health literacy training package for school staff. Um, there was technical assistance provided and um, the implementation um, resources were updated based on the feedback from these schools. So. Um, the classroom rising uh, was there. We also did the violence in school communities, which was an environmental scan and gap analysis of resources available in the public domain um, to address school violence um, from prevention to post-intervention. So there's a lot of work in this realm and it's really dynamic. So that was some of what we were doing. The network plans to pub publish a summary report um, on the environmental scan and gap analysis, um, as well as the school violence uh, collection, uh, prevention collection is, will be on the website. So. And then finally, there's a TA partnership with the SAMHSA Project, Project AWARE, which is another big SAMHSA initiative. And it's to support the mental uh, health related trainings and TA needs of over 90 Project AWARE grantees. Um, in the last year, um, they produced 98 products and resources and hosted 93 events for AWARE grantees. 
So they, um, there's a newsletter and all of those past things are available on the MHTCC website. So for the next month, month, month and a few days, go on there, peruse, download, um, as we're kind of in this limbo land of, um, of resources, but I'm also, um, putting in the NTAC page, which you can also find lots of information related to mental health needs for children, youth, and families. So I put that in the chat too. Thank you, Cindy. So much support uh, the, out there. My best practice uh, registry, and that best, best practice registry, we'll put the link in the, the chat for you there as well. And it's a resource library of programs and interventions just like you just asked for earlier on the in the chat, uh, but this is for suicide prevention uh, framework for specific populations and youth. So our goal with this was to increase health equity by providing access to a broad selection of programs and interventions. And you have access to that through the SPE Tech and uh, SP, uh, SPRC uh, dot org. Uh, we're gonna put that in the, the chat for you to get that as well. And you can go there and check that out at registry. So the key points that we want you to take away from today, of course, is that uh, implementing mental health initiatives is not about addressing immediate needs, but, but it's also about laying the foundation for a healthier future for our youth. By prioritizing mental health, we together can significantly reduce substance misuse and enhance overall quality of life for our young people. And that includes cultural sensitivity, um, and tailoring those programs, uh, make sure that they're culturally sensitive, being inclusive and ensuring that all youth, regardless of their background, have access to mental health services. It includes policy and advocacy, uh, advocating for policies that support mental health and substance misuse prevention and, and, and that almighty funding, ensuring adequate funding for all mental health initiatives to sustain long-term efforts. And y'all talked about that in the chat as well about resources being an issue. It includes collaboration and partnership. Uh, Multi-stakeholder involvement is the key. Collaboration between schools, healthcare providers, and community organizations, as well as the family are crucial because we have to share our resources. When we share our resources and pool our resources, then we also are pooling expertise and we, we can create a a more comprehensive support network when it comes to this area. And then um, it was also emphasized by both Cindy and I, early intervention. Uh, you have to look for early detection, look for those signs early on mental health issues so you can prevent uh, substance misuse. When they start showing those signs, and we showed you a video on those signs, and you can start to make some changes in and provide mental health support early so you can reduce the likelihood of you turning to substances as coping mechanisms. Do you have any final thoughts for us, uh, Cindy, before we get to the evaluation? My I'll final show. thoughts is please, preventionists, keep doing what you're doing because we need you on the other side too. So um, I think that like the whole ounce of a prevention is worth a pound of cure that is always going to ring true. Um, so um, we feel it. And I think that it's so great to see all the fun and innovative programs that are happening. So I'm glad to be here and glad to see you all doing the great work. Thank you, Cindy. Someone already like made a comment, but I wanna ask just one more question of you that you can answer in the chat. What tools, more resources are you going to look into after today's training? And someone already said they're going to look into the SPA, uh, RC, uh, best practice registry. What tool do you plan to use that you've seen today? Let's put it in the chat for a curriculum, best practice registry. Okay, everything. WISE, BPR. Okay, MHTTC. You only got 30 days to get that taken care of. Sport, PPW, 
of this feedback, project aware. Okay. So it's essential to remember that each of us has a role to play in this endeavor, whether you're an educator or a parent or a healthcare provider or a community leader. Your, your efforts can make a tangible difference in the lives of young people. And that's what we want to, we want to do. And we do it through education, we do it through early intervention, and we do it through creating a culture of openness and support. And we can reduce the prevalence of substance misuse and promote overall well-being. So let's commit to working together, sharing our resources, and fostering a community where youth feel valued and supported and empowered and make healthy choices. I thank you again for your dedication to this important cause. I uh, thank Cindy for, for giving us her time today in order to, to get this message out. And I look forward to seeing the positive impact that each and every one of us can achieve together. Are there any questions? You can put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them. But I also want to go ahead and ask that the link for our, our feedback be put in there. Well, we want your feedback from today. This is our survey link, um, and uh, if you can please complete it. If you have a smartphone, you can use the QR code. Uh, uh, the link is also going to be put into the chat as, as well. As if neither one of those work for you, then you're going to get a pop-up uh, when you leave, and you'll get an opportunity to complete the survey then. But we need your feedback uh, today on this important issue so that we can continue the work that we do. Thank you for all the thank yous. We have a lot of thank yous. Thank you. This was fantastic. So as I promised you, we would uh, begin on time and we would end on time. Uh, I'm Derek Neely. want to just remind you that we have a South Southwest PTTC website. Uh, if you just put in South Southwest PTTC or SSW PTTC into your browser, it will give you the option to choose our website, and this is what it looks like. And when you come there, you can join our mailing list. You can get some products from us, and most importantly, those resources that we talked about today are available as well. Uh, again, I emphasize you'll get a copy of this uh, presentation. Uh, it will include the references as well as the resources that you see here. So thank you, everyone, for today. And with that said, it is 2.30.